Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, as I said earlier, we're glad to be in your house. And we'd ask that your Holy Spirit would be here present with us this morning. Number one, to guide me in what I say here this morning, that it will lift somebody up. But not only that, Lord, that you will be with each person here, Lord, that they may be blessed by being here today. In Jesus' wonderful name, I ask this. Amen. Amen. As most of you know, I usually tell a few stories when I do a sermon up here. Didn't Jesus tell stories? He did, didn't he? The first one I'm going to share here this morning is, took place in France several years ago, and this was back before modern medic, medicine that we have today. There was a man there that was bitten by a rabid dog. The doctor looked at him and told him, I not much I can do. You have a short time. And it's going to be over for you. The man said, I need a piece of paper and a pencil. He gave him a piece of paper and the guy is writing furiously, writing, writing, and writing. And the doctor came in and said, you know, you do have a few days, okay, you know, to get your stuff in order. So you, know, you can take your time. He says, you need to think carefully about your estate. The patient replied, replied sharply, I'm not making out my will. I'm making a list of all the people that I'm going to bite. <laughs> it sounds humorous, but you know our world is full of people, full of hate, and are not willing to forgive. And that's what we're going to be discussing this morning, forgiveness. Bitterness. Some people are controlled by it. They have been treated cruelly and wish that bad things would happen to their offenders. Some brood for years. Have you ever been upset with somebody for years? I, don't answer me. I'm sure that some of us in our lifetime have been upset with somebody, okay? Sometimes they are so angry, they will make sure that something bad does happen. We're seeing that happening today in our world, aren't we? The news is full of it. People getting even. But the Bible says that this is the very worst possible solution to resolve the hurt in their lives. How many of you have uh, seen by getting angry with somebody that really resolves anything? It never does, does it? The real solution to dealing with injustice from others, and we know this, is not vengeance, unchecked anger, or bitter brooding. It's forgiveness. If you want to experience an abundant life in Jesus, you must learn how to forgive those who have hurt you. In Revelation 12 and verse 12, the Bible says the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. He's working overtime today, folks. Satan is the angry and vengeful one and he is the instigator of our thoughts of revenge. When we start thinking those thoughts, whose thoughts are those? 
Those are Satanists coming right through us. Oh, we need to get on our knees right now. What about Jesus? Jesus said his parable about forgiveness is one of the most essential Bible stories for our time. Matthew 18, 21. If you've got your Bibles handy, maybe you want to know, read this. And we all know this little story. It was a little confrontation here. He talked with uh, his apostles there, his uh, disciples. And I think it was Peter that said, How often shall my brother sin against me, verse 21, and I forgive him? And Peter says, What do you think, Lord, up to seven times? You might think Peter was a bit stingy with his mercy, only seven. Forgive someone only seven times? We often have to forgive our spouse that much in a single week. I'm sure my wife has to do more than that in a single day with me. But in the time of Christ, religious leaders taught that God was willing to forgive you only three times. It was three strikes and you're out long before baseball was invented. Peter, knowing Jesus was indeed merciful, bravely doubled the number of times he had been taught to forgive someone and even added one for good measure. But Christ's response in verse 22 shocked not only his disciple, but tragically shocks most professed Christians today. Matthew 18, 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. How many is that? 490. Now, most people, most Bible scholars agree that Jesus wasn't setting a literal limit. God isn't sitting up in heaven checking off the number of times he has forgiven you. Thank you, Lord. Otherwise, all of us would have already exhausted our quota. God's mercy doesn't run out at 490 allotments of grace. As long as we are willing to repent, the Lord will forgive. The issue is that God asks the same of his people. Oh, oh, wait a minute, Lord. I have to do that? Don't keep track of how many times you've forgiven your friend, your co-worker, your spouse for his or her unkind words or actions. God claims and has proven time and time again in your life and mine that he is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. The Lord does not quickly give up on us all. Thank you, Lord. Seven times Jesus cast devils out of Mary. Solomon said, a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. That's from Proverbs 24, 16. The Gospel of Luke adds, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. The Bible is full of promises that connect forgiveness with the number seven, a number representing completeness and perfection. In Daniel chapter 9, when the prophet prayed for his people, God sent an angel to declare that 70 weeks, 70 times seven for 490 literal years of additional mercy would be extended to the wayward Jewish people. That ran out in 70 AD, right? Is there still hope for a Jew today? Yes, there is. What a loving, merciful God that we have. Jesus next shared the parable of the unmerciful debtor. We're going to spend a little time in Matthew 18, so you might want to turn there. And we all know this story. 
about the gentleman that owed so much money. But in Matthew 18, verses 23 and 24, Jesus explained, there is, the, there is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought into him which owed him 10,000 talents. The main part of this we want to remember is the kingdom of God is like this, okay? So as we're reading this parable, we want to remember that a talent was the largest currency in the New Testament times. Do you know how much it is? I'm going to tell you how much it is. It's anywhere between 56 and 75 pounds of metal. That's one talent. That's a lot of metal, especially if it's silver or gold. <laughs> so, it was a ridiculously large sum. Indeed, it is the largest sum of money mentioned in the scripture. You could never pay back this kind of debt, not even over many lifetimes. The king's servant must have had a royal credit card and evidently had been freely spending the king's money. Perhaps going on expensive business trips, staying in luxurious hotels, I don't know how many of them were around back then, and feasting lavishly with friends at posh restaurants. I don't know how many of those were around back then. He might have even had a drinking or a gambling habit that drained precious government resources. As he amassed this mountain of debt, surely he lived in constant fear, knowing that a day of reckoning was coming. But he could not help himself. As it always does, Judgment Day finally came and caught up to this debtor. As he was not able to to pay, verse 25, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. In America, if you get into a financial crisis, you can declare bankruptcy. In Bible times, you were thrown into prison and your family could be sold into slavery. It was an unmitigated disaster. When the servant saw all of his possessions being carried away from his house and his wife and children being hauled away, in desperation he fell on his knees before the king and cried out, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Of course, the servant could never repay his master and the king knew it. Yet the heart of the compassionate and understanding king was touched by his wayward servant's pleading. Verse 27, the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Amazing. The king didn't set up a payment plan or negotiate a settlement with his debtor. He simply forgave it all. Yet the heart of the compassion, or excuse me, already, how does God deal with our sins? Does he calculate our balance due, divide it with a certain number of installments, and then enroll us in a payment plan? Not at all. God has compassion and freely forgives us all, just as the king forgave his servant this enormous, enormous debt. Now this would be a nice place to end the story, but Jesus went on to make his most important point, verse 28. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him how much? A hundred pence. A hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Pay me what you owe me. 
This man's heavy-handed actions are shocking in the light of the mercy that he had just experienced. He didn't leave the presence of the king with appreciation. He walked away mad. He convinced himself that his buddy still owed him what amounted to a few weeks' wages. Why was he so harsh, demanding that he be, be paid back immediately? Evidently, his own forgiveness from the king didn't sink in. Think about the vast difference between 10,000 talents and 100 pence. It took 6,000 pence to make one talent. It's as if our debt to God is like the distance from the earth to the sun, 93 million miles. 93 million miles. By comparison, the debts other owe us are at most a few yards. The Lord said that he is willing to forgive us the vast distance between the earth and the sun, yet we struggle to forgive each other a measly 12 inches. Jesus contrasted these absurdly differing amounts of money to show how much God had forgiven us in comparison that how little we're sometimes willing to forgive each other. I often meet people who have, who have quit attending church. When asked, why don't you go anymore? Many relate stories of how they were treated poorly or how a church member or a pastor was unkind to them. They feel that if they stop going to church, they will somehow get even with the other party. Have any of you ever had that feeling? Well, if I just left, all my troubles would be over because I can't get along with so-and-so. But how does moving away from God's house teach anyone a lesson? It just doesn't make sense. And it is, it is exactly what the devil wants us to do. We need to be here. Don't let somebody else, don't let me drive you away. If I've done something to offend anybody here, Forgive me, please. And we are all a work in progress. Every one of us here is a sinner. And we cannot be looking at others. We need to look at Jesus. Don't ever fall into the devil's trap by withdrawing from the church. There will always be noxious weeds mixed in with the good grain. I'm probably one of the noxious weeds. Pray for me, okay? Even Jesus had a Judas in his church. So don't let Satan scare you away because of stiff-necked people. Indeed, those who wound others have often been wounded themselves. If we could see the pains from their past, we might have more empathy toward them. Is it, it is easier to forgive others when we know what is going on in their hearts. We, can, we need to know each other a little better. We need to press together. We need to pray for each other, folks. We are all going through trials. We are all having troubles, okay? We need to encourage each other. Getting back to Matthew 18, verse 29, Jesus continued, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Sounds like something was just said a few minutes earlier by the other fellow. Have patience with me. Notice the servant who owed a much smaller amount gave the exact pleas as the servant who owed a much larger amount. Verse 30 continues, and he would not 
but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Pause a minute before you point an accusing finger at this man's cold-hearted response. Consider that Jesus might be speaking to you or me. Have you ever been unwilling to forgive others? Is that happening in your life right now? Each one of us has a debt that Jesus willingly suffered to take our place. He was beaten, spit upon, denied by his friends, and nailed to a cross. Look at your Savior hanging there. Listen as he tells you, hanging on that cross, I forgive you. We put him there, each one of us. How can you then say, but Lord, I just cannot forgive that person at church who has gossiped about me or took over my church office? What does that say about your Christian experience? Over the years, I have read or heard stories of people who were abused as children for years by unrepentant family members. Should they forgive these evil perpetrators? This is a very difficult and fair question. Let me clarify, forgiveness does not mean we let offenders off the hook for their bad behavior. Some people need to be held accountable for their actions by the laws of the land. Nor does forgiveness mean we let people constantly use us as a physical or emotional punching bag. Rather, forgiveness is giving up bitter, bitterness and resentment. It is choosing to release malice, putting the other person into God's hand and being willing to pray for your enemy. This isn't in here. And I was thinking I maybe I shouldn't share this. But I'm going to share it anyway. A few years ago, I was married to another woman, not my wife. And she got involved at work with a gentleman. And uh, that's a hard thing to go through. I don't know if any of you have been through a situation like that. I was very upset. We were married for 27 years. We had three children. The last was just finishing up high school. One was, one was in college. I was angry. I wanted to do damage to this guy. He had split up our home. Tore up. One evening, I was sitting there at our dining room table. And I was asking the Lord about this situation. I was really upset about it. And then the Lord told me, didn't audibly speak to me, but in my mind, now Wayne, you know how I felt as I lay on that cross. I said, oh yeah, I know what you're going through. I love my wife very much. And to see this happen, God loves you very much. Jesus loves you very much. 
And he told me, he says, Wayne, pray for them both. Pray for them. Oh, I can't do it, Lord. I can't do that. Not after what they've done. The Lord pleaded again, Wayne, pray for them. That's the greatest thing we can do for somebody that's hurt us. The greatest thing is to pray for them. It doesn't change them. Maybe, maybe it does. But it changes us. If we hold bitterness in here, we're going to be lost, folks. We cannot have that. Pray for these individuals that have, have hurt you, offended you. S several months later, <clears throat> well, it was probably a year or so, I had remarried to my wife, and uh, we had gone to a friend's house, and my ex was there with her new husband. And when they were getting ready to leave, because they were uncomfortable because we were there, and I was moved to get up and to give this man a hug. And I felt him just tense. He was, he, he didn't know how to handle it. But I did it because the Lord moved me to do that. I had the love in my heart for this man. He's going to be lost if he doesn't accept Jesus. And wouldn't it be wonderful if they were both saved? Oh, amen. That was not in here. I'm sorry, but it goes along with this forgiveness. Sometimes it's good for us to share experiences in our lives because maybe somebody here is going through something similar. So if you are, I pray for you. Pray for these individuals that have hurt you, okay? When you refuse to forgive others who have hurt you or you are giving them permission to keep hurting you. You continue to be a slave to their offense. Don't let it happen, folks. Jesus told us to love our neighbors and our who? Our enemies. Sometimes the people who hurt us most deeply are those closest to us. It was Abel's own brother, Cain, who slew him. David's son tried to murder him. As children of God, we have turned our backs on him repeatedly. We should never forget that God demonstrates his own love toward us in the while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Let's face it, even after you forgive somebody, you might not be able to forget what happened. But Martin Luther said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. When you are tempted to ruminate on some individual who offended you, and relive the feelings, try praying for him or her. It might be hard at first, and it was. It was, I didn't know how to do it, but I kept going back and praying. It might be hard at first, but remember, until a person is converted, it is perfectly normal for him to act like a selfish devil. Pray for the person's conversion. What happens when we indulge an unforgiving heart toward others? Let's go back to our parable in Matthew 18. Look at verses 31 to 33. When his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came to told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. 
Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servants, just as I had pity on you? When we receive Christ's forgiveness, it softens our hearts. We will have compassion on others, even towards those who have offended us. The Apostle Paul taught, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We should generously, what? Generously forgive. Are we there yet? Some of us aren't. We need to generously forgive, just as the Lord has generously forgiven us. Jesus emphasized this pattern in the Lord's Prayer. We read that earlier for the scripture reading. I'm going to read just the last section, verses 12, chapter 6, verses 12, 14, and 15. And forgive us our debtor as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, if you what? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive your trespasses. But verse 15, if you forgive not men their trespasses, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Is it important? If we can't do that, the Lord cannot forgive us. Don't hold a grudge. Be forgiving. An unforgiving heart brings serious consequences. Going back to Matthew 18. After the king rebuked his servant, the Bible says in verse 34, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. In verse 35, Christ's sobering point concludes, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Forgiving others, folks, is not optional. It is mandatory. It's not an option. Hard to do. We can't do it on our own. But with the Holy Spirit coming into our lives, we can do that. For a Christian, forgiving others shouldn't feel like an obligation. No more than keeping the law should feel like an obligation. Why do we keep the law? Because we love the Lord. That's why we keep the law. It's not by works. It's because we love him. And because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You will know you are converted when you do both as a natural outflowing of Christ's love in you. Forgiveness opens heaven's doors to great blessings. I've seen this happen when I hugged that individual. He didn't know how to react. And it's something I, I didn't do on my own. The Lord just like pick me up, move me over there, and made me hug him. <laughs> but I would have done it knowing what the outcome was because I think it made a difference there. The only Jesus some people are going to see, folks, is that Jesus that lives within you.
When was the Holy Spirit poured out in great measure on the earthly church? The disciples had bickered about which one of them would be the greatest, who would sit next to Jesus in the kingdom. But when they saw their Savior dying on the cross, they realized that they were all guilty of forsaking him. After Christ ascended heaven to heaven, they gathered in an upper room and they prayed prayer. There were many tears and apologies. They forgave one another. Then the Holy Spirit came upon them. Just as they came together in one accord, so will the church in the final days receive the latter rain when God's people repent and forgive one another. To be clear, Jesus' parable does not teach that God forgives us after we forgive each other. Quite to the contrary, the Lord forgives us first. Indeed, you have no power within yourself to forgive others except as Christ has forgiven you. The parable tells us that the king first forgave his servant. He set the example he wished his people would follow and then expected his servant to go and do likewise. But the ungrateful servant did not have a forgiving spirit. He did not allow the compassion of the king to change his heart. When the servant wouldn't forgive in turn, all that he owed was put back onto his account. I don't want all that I owe the Lord put back on my account. He's taken that. But if I'm not careful, he can give it all back to me. I need to be very careful. I need to be forgiving. I need to be loving to others. When Christ forgives us, we must walk in that same spirit. Yet forgiveness isn't simply a legal transaction. Peter thought of it in a mechanical way, attempting to follow the letter of the law and completely overlooking God's desire that we obey from the heart. When it is our motive to love and even forgive our enemies, only then will we reveal to others the most beautiful attributes of God. I want that in my life. Another story. The famous Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned to paint a mural on a monastery during dining hall in Milan, Italy. The result was the Last Supper. We all know it well. <clears throat> it depicts J Jesus sitting with his disciples at a feast table just after he had told them that one of them would betray him. During the time da Vinci was working on the piece, he got into an argument with another famous Italian, Michelangelo. Did you know this? Interesting story. The biographer of Vasari wrote that they had an intense dislike for each other. Two artists kind of jealous of each other, kind of upset with each other. The two were jealous of each other's work and often made disparaging comments about one another in public. Legend has it that when the time came, for Leonardo to paint the face of Judas in the Last Supper. You know where it's going, don't you? He got the sinister idea of using the face of his rival, Michelangelo. That'll get him. I'll get even with him. To be the face of the betrayer. He felt it was a great way to immortalize how he felt about his enemy. Now think about yourself, folks, as we're reading these stories. People came by as he worked, and they gasped when they recognized the face of Michelangelo as Judas. Leonardo 
Leonardo felt some temporary vindication. But then came the last step in his grand artwork, painting the face of Jesus. As he tried to capture the image of Christ, he would paint his countenance, but would feel dissatisfied and he would wipe it away. For the next few weeks, he did this over and over again. He had Jesus' body completed, but he couldn't create the right face, that magnificent countenance of mercy and kindness. In desperation, Leonardo prayed. We need to pray, folks. He prayed that he could paint that face that would express the love and compassion of Christ. Lord, help me to see your face, he pleaded to God. Finally, a voice spoke to him. You will never see the face of Jesus until you change the face of Judas. Is there somebody that needs your forgiveness? Is there somebody that you need to forgive? You will never see the face of Jesus until you change the face of Judas. Leonardo was convicted. He thought about Jesus on the cross, praying for the forgiveness of those who crucified him. Who crucified him? I did. You did. And about how offended he himself had been by petty insults. Do we let these insults affect us? We are so determined to pay people back that all we can see is what they have done wrong. We folks are the ungrateful servant. Demanding our debtors pay up in full, yet our vengeful hearts keep us from fully seeing Christ and his forgiveness. Do you need to erase the face of an enemy in your life? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> Sorry. Do you need to erase the face of an enemy in your life? Do you need to write a letter, make a phone call, or talk with someone who has wounded you? Brothers and sisters, it's time to let it go. The moment has come to say, I forgive you. Perhaps it begins by you asking forgiveness. Have you done something to wrong somebody else? Maybe you need to talk to them and ask forgiveness. One other story. It's a quick, quick story. A few years ago, I was in our church up in Washington, and one of our elders in the church was having a little problem with one of the deacons. I was an elder there, too, and, and he called me and said, Wayne, he says, I've got this problem with so-and-so, and we can't seem to settle it or get it straightened out. Would you mind coming? What does the scripture say in Matthew 18? If you can't solve it between yourselves, invite an elder or you know, somebody else in. He was following Matthew 18. And so I said, sure, I, I wouldn't mind doing it. And then all of a sudden, something came to my mind. I had had words with my neighbor about something. I forgot what it even was now. And I says, give me a few minutes because the Lord has just impressed me. I cannot help you until I take care of something that I did wrong. And so I went to my neighbor and asked for forgiveness. And then I went to the other problem and that was solved very quickly. But I don't think it would have happened if I wouldn't have taken care, taken care of this other thing first. You know, if we've wronged somebody, make it right. 
Anyway, it says the moment has come to say, I forgive you, we need to do that. Either way, when you strike out the person's debt, you will see the face of your compassionate king. Oh, Lord, we want to be like Jesus. We want to have love for others, Lord. Help us to love others. Help us to love our enemies. Help us to be forgiving in our spirit. Be with us, each one. In Jesus' name, amen.